In this example, we see that the Germans also now have a couple of submarines and a couple of naval air bombers in the sea zone uh, in the three section and one section of the box, while the Commonwealth has two aircraft carriers in the four box along with the battleship and cruiser. The Germans previously decided not to commit their submarines to the upcoming uh, naval combat. Both sides rolled search rolls. The Commonwealth rolled very well with a one, while the Germans rolled a four. As a result, because the naval air modify the search number here in fine weather by one, the Germans will be able to include the three surface ships and both naval air bombers in the upcoming combat. Meanwhile, the Commonwealth is able to include all of their units in the combat. So calculating the surprise points, the Germans will get four for their highest modified search number, plus one that the Commonwealth rolled for a total of five surprise points. The Commonwealth will get five, since the range of the carriers will increase this by one, plus four from the German roll to give them nine. Nine surprise points for the Commonwealth minus five German gives the Commonwealth a net four surprise points that they will be able to spend in the upcoming battle. We next move on to determine the combat type. Since both sides have naval air units involved in the combat, either one can choose whether or not to make it a naval air combat. Starting with the active side, which in this case is the Commonwealth since they initiated the combat during their com uh, naval combat step. The Commonwealth would like to take this opportunity to try to shoot down and destroy some of these naval air units without exposing their carriers to potential damage from Bismarck. So they're going to select a naval air combat. Now, a naval air combat is resolved exactly like a surface naval combat, except you must first fight an air battle between both sides opposing uh, air units. Let's see what that looks like in this circumstance with the case of a couple of carriers involved. At this point, you kind of step out of the naval combat and it becomes a regular air-to-air -air combat. So both sides will have to establish a fighter stream and a bomber stream. In this case, the Germans have no aircraft, no fighter aircraft involved. So they have no fighters, they have merely their bombers and they've selected the um, uh, Dornier 18 as its lead bomber. The Commonwealth has two aircraft carriers, and this is where aircraft carriers are kind of nice, especially in naval air combat, because of their flexibility. The Commonwealth would like to try, the goal is to try to shoot down or at least abort the German bombers in the sea zone. So therefore, they have opted to take the three factors of the Indomitable's air component and make those all air-to-air -air factors. So this essentially becomes a three air-to-air, -air, zero air-to-sea uh, fighter. And they're going to use the Formidable's two factors as air-to-sea, allowing them the opportunity to strike at the German ships, primarily because the two would, uh, additional factors would not increase their air value beyond three in this case. It would be a 3.2 to the Germans one, which would be a 2.2. They would still be on the plus two column. And since the Germans have no fighters, that means all of the Commonwealth bombers are automatically cleared through. So HMS Formidable's aircraft will continue on and we will come back to them when we get to the uh, naval air portion of the, um, of the combat. For now though, we would have an air-to-air -air combat to fight with the Commonwealth air value of three versus a German air value of one, giving them a roll on the plus two column while the Germans are rolling on the minus two column. At this point, the Commonwealth, of their uh, four surprise points they have, they could choose to spend two surprise points to increase their air-to-air -air value by one or spend two surprise points to decrease the Germans' air-to-air -air value. Now, the important thing to remember is you can only use these surprise points to modify your air values or your opponent's air values at the beginning of the naval air combat, not or beginning of the air combat, not during each round of the air combat. 
and you would proceed to roll two dice, consult the air combat chart until such time as one side either chooses to abort or all of the bombers have been cleared through or everybody has been shot down and so forth. For the purposes of this example, we uh, can go ahead and roll a couple dice here. The non-phasing side would roll first, which means the Germans would be rolling first. They happen to roll a 13 on the minus two column is no effect. The Commonwealth fighters would then shoot back with an 11, which is going to be a defender clears through any one bomber. So the Germans would then clear through their best bomber and he would move on to attack the Commonwealth ships in the next step of the naval air. At this point, the Germans, having gotten at least one of their bombers through and don't feel like pressing their luck, choose to abort from the combat. This means that the German naval air bomber will need to abort from the sea zone entirely. So it would be turned face down and returned to base somewhere uh, that it is eligible to return to. The Indomitable, having done its part as its fighters, will now essentially become a target. It is just a ship at this point, and it will participate in the rest of the combat as a ship uh, face up. Now, having fought the air battle, you then move on to the uh, step where the bombers attack the ships. Now, all of our naval air bombers have made it past the enemy fighter screen and have reached the fleets themselves to begin their bombing runs. Before they can drop their bombs and torpedoes on the enemy ships, however, they're going to have to make it past the enemy anti-aircraft fire. In this case, we'll start, we have our two bombers here, each attacking the enemy fleets. For the Formidable's air units, it has two air-to-sea factors. It is considered one aircraft uh, unit. The anti-aircraft value of the German task force is two, three, four. You then consult the naval combat chart using the anti-air row and the enemy bomber's column to determine how much anti-aircraft fire you will have. We see anti-air is the row we're looking at. We had a grand total of four factors, which puts us on the three to five column. They are shooting at one enemy bomber. We now look at the golden column here labeled AA, and you see a dash. This essentially means that the German ships are not putting up enough anti-aircraft fire versus so few bombers um, to have any sort of effect on them. So in this case, there will be no anti-aircraft fire against the British naval bombers attacking the German ships. If we go back and look at the German bombers attacking the British ships, you see the British have a total, since both boxes are involved, you total up all of the uh, factors on all the ships. It's two for the Indomitable, plus two for Prince of Wales, one for Newcastle is five, six, seven anti-air factors, and those are shooting at only one enemy bomber. Going back to our chart here, you can see on the anti-air row, we are in the six to nine column. There is one enemy bomber, and that puts us right here. We have a minus one slash six. All of your anti-aircraft results are going to be um, a number slash another number. If it is a regular number, like if we look down here where we have one slash three, this means that your the number of anti-air points that you um, that you inflict on the enemy unit is going to be the highest one die out of three total rolled. If it's a negative number, it's the lowest dice. So going back to our example here where we have minus one slash six, the Commonwealth player would roll six dice and he would take the lowest of those six. And that would be the number of anti-air hits or factors that would then be applied to the enemy bombers involved. If you have a lot of bombers and you have a lot of anti-aircraft you can uh, fire, you can see that this chart can get uh, to the point where you are rolling the highest two dice out of four. You can roll the highest three dice out of four, in which case you are rolling a three out of four. Three highest out of four looks something like this. This would be 10, six is 16, plus one, 17. That fleet would have 17 anti-aircraft 
hit to inflict upon any enemy bombers that are attacking them. Now, what does that mean? I rolled, in this case, with our current example, we have the lowest one of six dice. Well, we would roll six dice. We've got five and four. We've got eight and two. And we have a one and four. The lowest dice of all six of those is the six that we rolled. You would take that anti-aircraft hit and you would subtract it from the anti-air, or I'm sorry, the naval air factors of one of the enemy bombers. So in this case, instead of both of these naval air factors pressing home the attack against the British fleet, it would be reduced to one. When we go to implement the results on the naval air combat chart or determine what the results are, the German bomber would be using the air to sea. It would normally be a two, but because of the anti-aircraft fire, it has been reduced to one. So we're using this column here and it is shooting at a total of five enemy ships. So we come down to the five to seven, and you can see one naval air factor against five ships results in one abort result. For the Commonwealth bombers, they had two air to sea factors and they were attacking three enemy ships, which is going to result in two abort results. When it comes to implementing these results, it works just like it does for a surface combat, except that players will alternate selecting the target for the results rather than the owner selecting all of them. And the first result is chosen by the attacker, second by the owning player, third result attacker, fourth owning player, so on and so forth. You can spend three surprise points at this point to choose the target just as you could during a uh, surface combat. In this case, with one abort result, the German bombers would like to remove the at least one of the carriers in the sea zone, and so it would select the indomitable to receive the abort result. The Commonwealth player would then have to roll a die. By rolling a five, which is less than the six defense value, the indomitable would end up being aborted as a result of this round of the naval uh, of the naval combat. Likewise, on the German side, the formidable is going to first select Blucher for to accept the initial uh, abort result, and it rolled an eight. The eight is greater than the Blucher's defense value of six, which means it's downgraded to a one-half result. The German player now gets to select which of the other ships will suffer the second abort result. They decide to choose Bismarck. Bismarck rolls. Bismarck rolls a five. That is also greater than the Bismarck's defense value, so the abort result on Bismarck becomes a one-half abort. Now, at the end of implementing all of the results from the naval combat table, you add together all of the one-half results on a single ship. If it totals a full abort, the ship will be aborted. If, however, the only abort you have on a ship is a one-half abort, that is essentially rounded down to a no result and the ship is not aborted. So in this case, despite the fact that Formidable achieved two abort results against the Germans, they rolled well enough that they were able to downgrade each of those abort results to a one-half abort, therefore allowing both ships to ignore the result and remain in the combat. For the British, unfortunately, one of their carriers was aborted, and the Germans had one of their naval air units voluntarily aborted as a result of the air combat. So with Naval air combat, if you choose that combat type, you're first going to fight a regular air-to-air -air combat. Once the air-to-air -air combat is resolved, surviving bombers for both sides will attack the enemy task forces. First, you will calculate the anti-aircraft fire, apply that against the bombers, and then the bombers will um, inflict their results on the enemy ships. Now, if you have a large number of anti-aircraft points 
uh, any aircraft fire hits against the bombers, you could potentially abort the counter entirely or even shoot one down. So for every five points of anti-aircraft fire that hits, you can either destroy one carrier plane or you can abort one other bomber. For every 10 points that are scored, you could destroy two carrier planes or destroy one other bomber. And when you have, say, 16 or 17 any aircraft fire hits, you first take them in groups of 10. So when I showed you the highest three rolls of four, and we ended up with a total of 17 anti-aircraft hits, I would take 10 of those, and I could have used those 10 hits to destroy this bomber entirely. The bomber then does not get to attack or add its air to sea value to the uh, attack on the ships. After I do that, I still have seven points remaining. I would then take five points and apply that to any other aircraft. If say both of these German bombers were attacking, I would spend 10 points to destroy one of them. And it would be the owner's choice. They would destroy that one. I would have five remaining, which is enough to abort this land bomber. He would no longer get to attack, although he would survive to return to base face down. And since there are no remaining bombers, the fleet would not suffer any results. Now, if we had yet another enemy bomber attacking, I would still have those two points left. Those two points are used to subtract from the naval air value of one of the particular bombers attacking. So it's going to reduce the uh, air to sea factors that press home the attack. If we were looking at carrier planes uh, being the bombers, it would only take five points to destroy one of these. And if the Germans were able to generate 10 points of anti-aircraft value, they would be able to destroy both of those carriers with those 10 points. If you're playing the classic version, what that means is you're going to place a no planes marker on each of these carriers. They would then basically become targets for the enemy bombers at the end of the naval combat, not the naval combat round, but the naval combat, they would then be forced to return to base. If they were, if they successfully returned to base without being intercepted and, and uh, sunk, they would then go immediately into the repair pool. Speaking of returning to base, that is one thing that I forgot to mention on the interception. If a moving task force is successfully intercepted, normally it has two options. It can attempt to fight its way through or it could stop its move and go into uh, a section of the sea box. You cannot end your move and go into a section of the sea box if you are returning to base. You must attempt to fight your way through. And you've got to make sure that you will have enough movement points left to make it all the way to the port you are attempting to return to base at which means you're probably going to be needing to um, go into the zero or one box, most likely, uh, if, you're going, if you are returning to base and are intercepted successfully by the enemy. That's naval air combat. Let's look at the third and last type of naval combat, and that is the submarine combat.